long before man appeared on earth the world and the life on it were changing ever changing in the face of changing nature all living creatures must evolve adapt and struggle to survive man too must survive man also progresses but along the way times result in dangerous changes in our environment unchecked these changes may threaten our very survival man must stop his mishandling of nature and work toward a future with clean air to breathe clean water to drink uncontaminated soil in which to grow the food he needs oxygen producers like these vital to our environment must be protected this is our deep commitment to the future but how do we meet it the science of the peaceful uses of atomic energy is one of the ways man is responding in the fight to preserve and restore his environment the atomic energy commission from its inception has had a vigorous program in environmental research. The application of atomic energy to meet environmental objectives moves in two directions. First, supplementing the conventional power plants that pollute the atmosphere with clean atomic power stations. Secondly, to use the atom as a research tool to study our environment especially the burdens placed on the environment by modern industry. This challenging work offers many exciting career possibilities for scientists and technicians. Power production is one example. Electric power requirements in this country have been doubling about every 10 years. Sometimes the heavy demand exceeds the supply, causing power blackouts and brownouts. The basic principle of power production is simple. A heat source generates steam, which turns a turbo generator. The heat source may be coal, gas, or oil, called the fossil fuels. But there is another heat source, the atom, the nuclear fissioning of uranium. The discharge of noxious chemicals into the atmosphere is one thing coal and oil burning power plants have in common. Atomic power plants, on the other hand, don't release smoke containing such contaminants that pollute the atmosphere. Both conventional and atomic power plants discharge some excess heat into adjacent waterways. These thermal effects must be controlled and minimized. Methods are being developed, such as giant cooling towers and man-made lakes. Whatever the heat source, water is converted into steam, which turns the turbines, which drive the generators. When the steam leaves the turbine, it must be cooled and condensed back to water and returned to the boiler. The cooling water does not make contact with the radioactive core. Cool water is usually taken from rivers lakes, or the ocean. At atomic power plants, the water is pumped through the condenser and returned to its source as warmer water. Although so far, no significant detrimental effects of warm water on fish and other aquatic life have been found in the vicinity of nuclear power plants, thorough investigation will continue in order to assure that environmental impact will not be excessive when weighed against man's growing need for electricity. But of course, the slightly warmer water may be used beneficially for agriculture and even recreational purposes. Future, more efficient nuclear generating stations, such as the breeder, will release less heat per kilowatt. However, nuclear power plants do release very minute quantities of radioactivity into the cooling water and into the atmosphere. But federal standards carefully and conservatively 
regulate such releases to protect the public. In actual practice, the amount of radioactivity released is held to only a very tiny percentage of the amount permitted by the standards. The natural background radiation you would receive from taking a plane ride across the country or from spending a summer in the mountains would be about the same as you would receive if you lived next door to an atomic power plant for an entire year. One of the reasons for the success of our agriculture was the use of insecticides, resulting in more abundant crops due to the elimination of pests. But unfortunately, insecticides can be harmful to livestock and wildlife. However, insect control is a necessity. So by using atomic energy as a research tool, experiments are underway at a number of universities to develop insecticides which will do their job without causing side effects that harm the food chain from plant to animal to man. At the University of California at Riverside, the Department of Entomology is doing decisive research work in this area under the guidance of scientists such as Dr. Roy Fukuto. The purpose of these scientists is to aid in the development of insecticides which are selectively active. To put it simply, the goal is the creation of insecticides that control pests but do not harm humans or livestock. Well, how does nuclear energy come into the picture? Radioactive carbon is the research tool that traces the effectiveness of the insecticide being tested. Two samples of insecticides are being tested. Sample A, used as a control, is a compound currently on the market. It is poisonous to warm-blooded animals. The new compound, B, is selectively toxic to insects and therefore may be used without harmful effects to our environment. Both samples were previously tagged with radioactive carbon. The presence of radioactivity is detected with the radiation counter. The bottle caps have to be removed to obtain a measurable radiation count. Here we see some highlights of the experiment. This mouse is fed with compound A, the currently used toxic insecticide, and placed inside a metabolism chamber. A second mouse is given a sample of compound B, the new insecticide. The mouse is put into another metabolism chamber. The test animals spend predetermined time periods in the metabolism chambers. At certain intervals, urine specimens of the two test animals are taken to determine the relative metabolizing action of samples A and B by the test animals. The specimens are placed into this radiation counter to measure the radioactivity. Now a tiny amount of both samples is placed on this chromatography plate. The compounds will move to different places on this plate. Their position will indicate the nature of the compound. The slight radioactivity of the compounds makes it possible to trace them on a photographic film for easy visibility. Thus, atomic energy, through the position of the spots, helps the chemist reach the conclusion that compound B, the new insecticide, is indeed less dangerous to warm-blooded animals than the sample taken from the currently used insecticide. Although it is illegal to dump oil into coastal waters, some ships still flush out their fuel tanks, discharging oil into coastal regions, usually at night. As a result, oil slicks may be washed up on beaches destroy marine life, and even cause fires. 
since our bodies of water are already burdened with more waste material than they can manage, the Coast Guard has added another duty to its routine patrols, protection of the marine environment. When an oil slick is located by the helicopter, a Coast Guard cutter is dispatched to take samples. Scientists using atomic techniques will be able to relate the sample to the polluting ship. Samples for comparison can be taken from ships suspected of dumping the oil in that area. The link between the oil slick and the suspected ship can be established by a novel use of atomic energy called neutron activation analysis, which produces atomic fingerprints of the samples under investigation. A small nuclear reactor is used for the next step. The oil sample scooped from the ocean as well as the samples collected from the suspect ships are made radioactive. Then a radiation counter is used to produce a profile of each radioactive sample. The information is also recorded on a printout. The atomic fingerprints are compared. In the event that an oil sample from the suspected ship matches one of the oil samples retrieved from the ocean, the authorities can be reasonably sure who caused the pollution, and existing laws can be enforced. Wave energy and strong ocean currents often cause beaches and sandbars to appear and disappear. Beach erosion is a constant threat to recreation areas and homes near the sea, and sand eventually clogs channels. In some cases, constant, expensive dredging is required to clear harbors and channels for shipping. In order to learn more about the mysterious movements of the sand and perhaps help prevent our valuable beaches from eroding, the Atomic Energy Commission, Working Engineering Research Center, and Oak Ridge National Laboratory is studying how the pounding of the waves and currents above affects the movements of the sand below. These boxes contain sand tagged with tiny quantities of radioactive gold. Not enough for a treasure hunt, but sufficient to gain certain important information about our environment with the help of atomic energy. This sled is used to place the gold tagged sand at certain predetermined locations. The plastic bags will disintegrate in salt water. The tagged sand is placed along the beach according to a predetermined pattern. These experiments are conducted at Point Magoo in California. Deposits are made also below the waterline. Frogmen place stationary radiation monitors to help measure the radioactively tagged grains of sand that are spreading along the ocean floor. This roller-shaped apparatus, called the ball, is a highly sensitive mobile radiation counter. It is used to survey the gold-tagged sand. The study of one series of placements may continue for a week until decay and dilution make radiation undetectable. The ball is pulled along the beach and through the water for distances up to 1,500 feet from the shoreline. The signals picked up by this atomic radiation detector accurately reproduce data as indicated by this map, showing for the first time the movement of the sand under the sea. Rivers, by their very nature, have their own cleaning mechanism. But ever-increasing amounts of waste dumped into rivers often exceed the flowing water's capability for self-purification. With the use of AEC-produced radioisotopes, the Georgia Institute of Technology is studying the problem. These men are preparing atomic tracers for use in this research work. Bottles containing the atomic tracers and red dye are emptied into the flowing water. 
the red dye is used so that the movement of the radioactivity can be easily followed. Samples collected at various points downstream will be taken to the Institute for atomic The tests will indicate the decrease of radioactivity of the atomic. These data relate to the amount of oxygen absorbed from the air and will give a much more precise picture of a flowing stream's ability to purify itself. That is, to absorb oxygen upon which the very life of a river depends. The findings will aid in the proper placement of sewage plants and industrial facilities along rivers and help determine the permissible waste output. Industrial wastes are killing fish in the Great Lakes. In order to fight the problem, scientists are determining which pollutants are mainly responsible. They collect fish throughout the Great Lakes. The case history of every fish is fed into a computer. Then the vital organs of the fish are removed for analysis. AEC's Argonne National Laboratory, in cooperation with the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries, is trying to isolate the fish killers. Neutron activation analysis is used to identify poisonous elements such as mercury, copper, zinc, and arsenic, shown here in their specific profiles, their telltale atomic fingerprints. This information helps to provide a picture of the dispersion and types of the pollution in the Great Lakes. Belching batteries of smokestacks used to be the hallmark of industrial success. Today, they are signposts of deep concern to ecologists and the medical profession. AEC's Brookhaven National Laboratory, in conjunction with the National Air Pollution Control Office, took off on an airborne program of diagnostic studies to determine the extent and composition of typical plumes and their effect on the surrounding areas. Industrial plumes contain polluting sulfur dioxide. In this compound are naturally varying amounts of two types of sulfur. The ratios of the two types of sulfur can be measured by means of stable atomic isotopes. This information helps determine the intensity and dispersion of corrosive smoke particles and predict pollution patterns over our cities. The planes fly through the plumes at predetermined intervals to gather samples of the spreading pollutants. Samples brought back will provide knowledge of pollutants in industrial smoke. Such information is important to pollution control and will help decrease the damage to man and vegetation in the environment. This geodesic dome, the Climatron, houses a tropical forest in the center of the United States at the Missouri Botanical Gardens in St. Louis. Experiments in the fight against pollution are conducted under the guidance of Dr. David Gates using radioactive tracers to study the way plants convert carbon dioxide into oxygen and to what extent plants can absorb substances such as sulfur dioxide, one of the most dangerous pollutants from coal burning furnaces and automobiles. Photosynthesis is a key link in the chain of life. The functioning of the green leaf and other green plants is responsible for the survival of the human race. Changes in the environment due to pollution could jeopardize the process of photosynthesis. So it is essential to investigate the effect of pollution on the plant life of the world. The studies conducted here with the help of the atom yield valuable answers. Other answers will come from experiments in this forest at AEC's Oak Ridge National Laboratory under actual outdoor conditions. The tagging capability of radioactive cesium is used to learn more about the growing process of plants and trees and to help determine the flow of elements through the forest and its grasses, shrubs, and trees. And now, take a look into the possible future of the atom's fight to help our environment. 
perhaps underground atomic explosions could provide safe storage space for waste materials. New types of power plants employing nuclear fusion, producing temperatures hotter than the sun, hopefully someday could supply almost limitless pollution-free energy for the world of tomorrow. And perhaps the same energy in the form of the fusion torch could reduce the vast amounts of industrial and household wastes to their original elements, making the continued recycling of our resources a possibility. Yes, the fight for the preservation of the Earth's environment goes on. And one very valuable weapon in the arsenal of the ecologist is the magic of the atom.